This time we're going to do some actual programming and we're going to go over vectors in Python, particularly using NumPy, and we're going to talk about the k nearest neighbors algorithm. I'm not going to go over Python basics in this course, but I'm not going to use any crazy Python features, so if you don't have that much experience with Python, it's all right. I will, however, show you the basic setup that we need. So obviously you'll need Python installed, Python 3. And you can just go to python.org and go to their downloads page. Some people also like to use Anaconda, which is this tool set that people use for data science and other Python applications. But personally, I don't like to use any of these things. I prefer to just install Python and any related packages from the command line. I'm actually going to do everything in this course inside Debian, which is a Linux distribution. And most Linux distributions are based on Debian. It's sort of the grandfather of a lot of the other uh, Linux flavors. And I think it's great for uh, low level programming and for really understanding how computers work. So I'm going to stick to Debian. If you're using uh, any other Linux distro, the commands that I type here are probably going to be identical for you. And if you're using Mac, the commands will also be identical or at least very similar. So let's start out by installing Python 3. You can just do sudo apt-get install Python 3. And I already have Python 3 installed, but if you don't, you'll see uh, a new package uh, and some logs getting installed. You'll also uh, want to verify that Python 3 is indeed installed by just typing Python 3 at the command line. And if everything's okay, you should get the Python interpreter to come up and you'll see this little prompt here. And at the top here, you'll see the Python version. So I'm using Python 3.9, and I believe the latest is 3.10, but it doesn't really matter because, uh, again, I'm not using any bleeding edge Python features. So you can do things in here in the interpreter, like setting variables, um, adding things together, doing basic arithmetic. Um, but again, I'm not going to go over uh, most of this basic stuff. So I'm actually going to quit the interpreter, and I'm going to install NumPy, numerical Python, which is a library that makes, you know, Python useful, basically. So to install Python packages, we want the Python uh, package index, uh, this package management tool. And you can install that with sudo apt-get install python3-pip. I've already got it installed, and you can just type pip and then uh, dash dash version. And if you get some message like this, then it means pip is installed uh, correctly. So some people may need to type Python, sorry, pip3 dash dash version, um, because sometimes, uh, you know, you might already have pip installed for Python 2 on your system. Um, so just make sure that the path here is pointing to your uh, Python 3 uh, installation. So now we can actually install NumPy. So just do pip install NumPy. And I've already got NumPy installed as well. And we can verify that NumPy uh, is installed correctly by opening up the Python interpreter and doing import NumPy. And if you get nothing, uh, it means everything was successfully loaded into memory. And you can call uh, NumPy here, and you'll see module NumPy from some path on your local machine. So a couple other things. Instead of using the Python interpreter, I'm actually going to install uh, IPython. So IPython is interactive Python. And again, I've got this installed already. And you can start it by typing just IPython in the terminal. And you get a similar looking interpreter here. But the prompt is a little bit different. And IPython. Um, is just a, a nice version of the Python interpreter. For example, you get some nice uh, syntax highlighting like this. Um, and you get a nicely formatted tab autocomplete and a few other features that I'll, I'll show you in a second. You can do uh, import NumPy again like this. Uh, but actually, most people will not import NumPy the way that I've done it here. By convention, most people will do import NumPy as NP. So this just makes the code a little bit shorter. And in a lot of code out there in the world, you'll see people use num, uh, NP instead of NumPy. 
So just be aware of that. Okay, so let me escape the IPython terminal here. And I am going to go into a folder here. And in this folder, I have a Python script, main.py. So let me just quickly open this up. So this is a very simple script, just 40 lines or so. And it just shows uh, some of the different uh, functions and methods you can use from the NumPy library, as well as a, a small KNN example at the bottom here. So at the very top here, I import NumPy as NP, and throughout the rest of the script, I just use NP. So instead of just showing you them line by line here, I'm actually going to do something a little more useful. And this is where IPython comes in. So you can type IPython dash I, and I stands for interactive. And you can type in the name of a script. So I'm just going to use main.py here. And what this will do is it will execute main.py. And when it's done, it'll keep all the variables in memory. And then it'll open an IPython interpreter. So I just press enter here, and main.py was executed, and I have all the variables still here in memory. So for example, in the script, I had a scalar at the top uh, stored in a variable called a. And if I type a here, uh, you can see a still has a value of 3, which I assigned in the script. I also created a numpy array called x. And uh, it has the values here that I assigned it in the script. And I created another array called y. And again, same values from the script. So this is pretty useful for debugging and for you know, seeing what the state of a program is in the middle of it. So you can open up the IPython interpreter at the end of a script. You can also uh, actually call the terminal uh, in the middle of the script. So uh, that's a quick way to do debugging. So yeah, IPython is pretty useful. So now uh, I've already imported NumPy as NP at the top of the script. So NP right here is actually uh, already defined. Let's talk about NumPy arrays. So you have ordinary Python arrays, right? So you can type uh, one, two, three, four, for example, here. And inside here in the brackets, you know, this is a normal Python array. And you just pass this into np.array. And uh, for example, here, let's just call this, I don't know, uh, my vector. And this creates a NumPy array. And it seems similar to a Python array, but NumPy arrays are, you know, um, a different type of object. They have their own methods, and they're very useful for linear algebra. So if I type my vector and then dot, uh, and I can press tab, and IPython will show me uh, what methods are associated with this NumPy array. And I can continue to hit tab and go through each of these uh, functions, and I can see what arguments it takes. So this is pretty useful. OK, so let's talk about scalar and vector multiplication in Python. So scalars are represented just with variables. So I have a, for example. Um, and all you have to do is multiply a by x using the ordinary multiplication symbol here, just an asterisk. And a will be multiplied by every element in x. So if you look up at the top of this interpreter, you see a equals 3, and you have x here. And it's just what you expect. You just multiply every element by 3. So pretty straightforward. You can also add vectors together as long as they have the same number of elements. So I've added x and y here. You can also uh, subtract. And you know this is the same as uh, x plus the negative of y. So you get that. And you can keep adding uh, vectors together like this. right? And uh, you, know, you can think of any combination. And it will work uh, just as you expect. So the plus sign and the multiplication symbol here are overloaded to work with uh, NumPy arrays and scalars. So let's get into some more interesting stuff. We can do element-wise multiplication. You also know this is called the Hadamard or Sure product. And you just have two vectors with the same number of elements, and you just use the multiplication symbol, the asterisk, again. So x times y here, this is the element-wise product, and it's exactly what you expect. 
So more interestingly, we can do the dot product uh, of x and y. And you can do np.dot and then you pass in the two vectors here, and you get a scalar, which is the dot product of x and y. So that's one way to do it. But here's a much prettier way to do it, which is you do x dot dot and then y. So dot here is a member function of x, right? Um, so if you don't know about member functions, uh, you might want to review object-oriented programming. But basically, uh, objects have these member functions associated with it. And in Python and some other languages, you can call the function directly after the object in question. And implicitly, what this does is uh, this dot function here takes x, but it also takes y together. And it's the exact equivalent of the np.dot function above here. Uh, so the x dot y notation here looks just like the math notation. So I recommend you use this. It makes the code a lot more readable. OK, now that we've gone over the dot product, let's talk about the norm. If you do np dot, you won't find norm here. It doesn't exist. But inside np, there are other uh, sub-modules. So uh, one of them is called linalg, linear algebra. And inside here, you have the norm function. This exists. So all you do is pass in uh, whatever vector you want into this norm function. So I put an x, and this is the norm of x. And let's just double check that this is true. So from NumPy, uh, you can also get square root. And uh, I'm just going to autocomplete here because I typed this in earlier. Uh, so x has three elements here. Uh, the zeroth index, the first index, and the second index. And I'm just taking the square of each one. Uh, I add them all together, and then I take the square root, and I get the same thing as I got up here. Um, and you can pass in a vector of any length into norm. Uh, so y is the same, but for example, uh, I think we had y my vector up here. So this has four elements, so I can do np linalg norm uh, my vector. OK, looks good. Now let's think about x and y as points instead of vectors. So if I want to find the distance between these two points, uh, I can take the norm of the vector between them. And the vector between them is just the difference of those two points, right? So this right here is the distance between x and y. And remember, this is a distance, so I can just flip the x and y here. So basically, I'm multiplying this whole thing by minus 1. And I should get the same answer, which I indeed do. OK, that's basically all the NumPy you need to know for now. And with the tools that we covered in these last few minutes, we can actually jump into k nearest neighbors. So the k nearest neighbors algorithm is very simple, but very powerful. So let me just jump in and start with a visual example here. So imagine we have a handful of data points that are all two dimensional. So the first dimension we call x1, second dimension we call x2. And I plotted them here on this graph. If you look at my cursor, in the top right corner here, I have these blue points. These are two-dimensional vectors, and associated with these vectors, these four vectors, are a class label. So in this case, the label is blue. And then on the top left, we have five pink points, and then green, and then yellow. So these are four different categories or classes of data points. And we have this new data point uh, in gray here with a question mark. We're trying to predict which of these four classes the gray uh, question mark is going to belong to. So the only data we have about this gray point uh, are the x1 and x2 values. And k nearest neighbors just says that if you take the k nearest neighbors to the gray point, and you take the mode or the average or the median of those classes, that should give you a good indication of what the class of the gray point is. So to be specific, let's just consider the nearest neighbor. So k equals 1 in this case. And clearly, this blue point here is the closest point to uh, the gray point here. So we would just say that this gray point is also of class blue, right? 
And K nearest neighbors is a humble but powerful algorithm because, you know, maybe uh, whatever data we're trying to model here uh, is very complicated. Maybe we don't really know the underlying uh, reasons for why these points uh, are distributed the way they are. K nearest neighbors doesn't care. It just says that points that are close to each other will tend to be of the same class. And in this example, it makes sense because you see these four nice clusters. So intuitively, it makes sense that the gray point is probably going to be blue. So the K in K nearest neighbors is the number of neighbors that we take into consideration to determine the label of the point in question. OK, so in this case, K equals 1. And basically, we want to find the point that's closest to this gray point. So we can draw a circle with the gray point centered at it. And we just make the circle bigger until we hit some other data point. So in this case, we hit this blue point. And clearly, you can see that this blue point here is closest to the gray point. And we just say that because the nearest neighbor is blue, then this gray point will probably also be blue. That's it. So instead of k equals 1, we can consider k equals 2 or 3 or any other number. And for example, we just make the circle bigger. So here, we have another gray point, some other unknown point that we want to predict. And let's say we have a much bigger circle. So we have, in this case, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 data points inside the circle. So in this case, k equals 5. And we just take the mode. So there are more green points than yellow points. So we just say the class of this new point is green. Let's look at a real world example. So this data set consists of three different species of iris flower. And in this case, we are just looking at the sepal width and the sepal length. So sepals are the small leaves you find at the base of the flower. Uh, and basically, based on the width and length of the sepals, uh, we're trying to predict which class uh, the flower in question belongs to. In the top right here, you have three species, the Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. And you have these uh, colors associated with these data points. So basically, the way that you make this map is you take every single point in this 2D plane, and you run the KNN algorithm on it. So in this case, we're using k equals 15. So we find the 15 nearest points, and we take the mode, and that gives us the prediction for that point. Where my cursor is, for example, if I had a point here, uh, the 15 nearest neighbors um, have a mode of uh, orange, which is Setosa. So we make this point here orange. And we repeat this for all these points here. So this whole region here ends up being orange. And when I move here, uh, now the 15 nearest neighbors have a mode of uh, this uh, light blue color. So now this region starts being blue. Uh, so I move around here, move around here. Everything here is light blue. And when I get here into this boundary, the nearest neighbors uh, have a mode of this dark blue, Virginica. And uh, that's why this whole region here is purple. right? And note that the boundaries don't have to be clean, because in this example, we have data points that are sort of uh, overlapping each other. right? So for example, you have this light blue data point that's kind of way out over here. And on the other hand, you have this uh, dark blue way over here. And this makes things really messy. So this boundary here, uh, for example, you know, it doesn't look very clean. And you get these weird patches here. So if you had a point in this light blue area here, the 15 nearest neighbors would actually be uh, this light blue color. But you move just a little bit down, right? So the sepal width goes down just a little bit. And suddenly you're back into this uh, dark blue purple region, right? On the other hand, for Setosa, you have a pretty nice boundary here, right? Everything's kind of clustered here. And for this data set, uh, KNN seems to be pretty useful. And it's pretty amazing that you can predict uh, to this level of accuracy uh, the different uh, species of this iris flower just based on these two traits. So obviously, you can use KNN for a much larger number of traits, uh, features. So instead of just two, you could have you know, 10, 15, 1,000. A million, um, but it becomes less and less useful as you have more and more features. And the reason is it takes more points to fill a certain volume in higher dimensions uh, in order to actually accurately describe 
that higher dimension. So what I mean is, in this two-dimensional plane, uh, I don't know, let's say we have 100 points or something here, we have pretty good coverage of this plane, right? But if you take the same 100 points and you add a third feature, uh, now you can plot them in 3D, but you've increased the uh, area, the volume of the region that you're considering, right? You have the same number of points, but the space you're trying to fill is much larger. That means you have less coverage, and you probably have uh, less of an understanding of this volume. And now if you go into four dimensions, five dimensions, you know, 100 dimensions, and you still only have 100 points, uh, that means you are barely covering the volume that you're looking at. So to do K and N, or even any algorithm, uh, using only just 100 data points when you have 100 features, the probability that you're going to accurately describe that huge volume is very unlikely. So at a certain point, when you have too many features, you end up having a useless model. On the other hand, if you have too few features, then obviously that can be not so useful either. Because imagine in this example, we were only looking at the sepal length, right? So imagine taking a slice, a one-dimensional slice of this. So if you know, we, we just ignored completely the sepal width, uh, it may be even more difficult than it is now to separate the three classes like this. So again, this, uh, uh, this is actually different from the k value, which is the number of neighbors. In this case, we're talking about the number of features. So both of these numbers have a big impact on the quality of the KNN algorithm. You can have too few features and too many features, and you can have also too small k and too large k. And it takes a lot of trial and error to figure out uh, what's the right amount. Okay, so now that you have at least a two-dimensional picture of how KNN works, let's jump into some code and use KNN for movie recommendation. So first, we should install one more package, and this is called scikit-learn, which is also extremely useful. So they have a lot of documentation. You can just go to scikit-learn.org, and they have a lot of documentation, not just about their own code, but about machine learning techniques and lots of visualization. So it's a pretty helpful resource. We can also install scikit-learn through the command line. So just do pip install scikit-learn. And just know that if you want to import it, you actually have to do import sklearn. Okay, so let's go back to our script here, and I'm going to open it up. And at the very top here, note that I added this line from sklearn import neighbors, right? And this neighbors uh, here is the KNN algorithm. So before we actually use scikit-learn, I'm going to go down here to movie recommendation example, and I'm just going to show manually how you would do KNN. Uh, it's very simple. It just involves calculating distances between points. So starting at the top here um, with this array, ordinary Python array called possible genres, let's talk about how we would set up the problem. So imagine you have six different people. So down here you have Emma, Alex, Kate, Carl, Lily, and Sean. And they watch uh, six different movies. And for each movie, they give it a rating from one to five, where one is the worst, five is the best. And for movie one, for example, Emma gives it a rating of one. The next movie is three. Uh, the next is five, and so on. Alex gives the first movie a rating of five, the second movie a rating of one, etc. So basically, what we're trying to do here is predict um, the favorite genre of the person based on their ratings for the six movies. So if you go down here, we have. Emma's favorite genre is action, Alex's is horror, Kate's is comedy, and so on. But Sean, we don't know what Sean's favorite genre is. And the point of this problem is to try to predict what Sean's favorite genre is. So the way that I've written these variables, uh, you'll notice that after each name I have a uh, underscore x. These are for the ratings, and over here I have underscore y. So x here is the input variable, it's our data. And we're trying to use the x data here to predict uh, the y. And in particular, we're trying to predict 
Sean's Y, Sean's favorite genre, based on the X's for Emma, Alex, Kate, all the way through Sean, and using the Y's from Emma through Lily, right? So we can use K and N to do this. And basically the intuition here is that uh, we look at the people who are most similar to Sean in terms of their ratings, and that will tell us what Sean's favorite genre is. So all we have to do is calculate the norm between the x values, right? So for example, I want to see the distance between Emma's ratings and Sean's ratings. So these ratings up here, these are vectors of six elements, six D vectors, right? So this is a vector like any other vector, so we can just uh, subtract two vectors. You know, we can think of these vectors as points. We subtract two vectors and we take the norm and that gives us the distance between the two points. So to see how far apart Emma and Sean are, uh, we just calculate the norm. And basically uh, we want to find the person who is most similar to Sean, the closest to Sean. And we will just assign Sean's favorite genre to be that person's favorite genre. So in that case that would be k equals 1, so the closest neighbor, the nearest neighbor. But we could also do, uh, you know, k equals 2, 3, 4, and so on. And that is a very simple way to predict Sean's favorite genre. So let's leave the script here. And I'm going to run IPython on the script. And for example, uh, I can look at Emma underscore x. This is already in memory. I can look at Alex underscore x, get his ratings. I can get Emma's favorite genre. This is part of our included data. Alex underscore y, and so on. So if I want to find the distance between Emma and Sean, I can do np.linelch.norm, and then Emma x uh, minus Sean x, and I get 4.47. And I can do this for uh, any other pair of people, right? So I could do uh, Lily and Sean. So uh, you can see here that the distance is less than the distance between Sean and Emma, so Sean is more similar or closer to Lily. So if we look at Lily's favorite genre, it's comedy, and Emma we see up here is action. So for example, it's more likely that Sean's favorite genre is also comedy, um, as opposed to action, at least according to K nearest neighbors. So all we have to do is compute all the different distances between Sean and every other person, right? So we can go for Alex uh, and so on, and we just find the nearest neighbor. Uh, let me actually display all of the X data into one uh, set of arrays. So this data X, uh, I've already created it in the script. I just uh, made it like this, where I do an MP array, and inside here I have an array of arrays. So I would do Emma X, uh, Alex X, and so on. And you get this array of five elements where each of the elements uh, is one of the X vectors, right? And this is just a nicer way to visualize uh, what's going on, and it's nice to have everything in one variable here. And we're going to need this later for scikit-learn. I can also do uh, data underscore y, and all I did here is uh, np array, and inside here I passed an array with Emma underscore y, Alex underscore y, uh, and so on all the way to Lily underscore y, right? Okay, and you'll notice uh, the number of uh, rows here is 5, and the number of elements in y is 5, so, you know, we have 5 people after all. So now, uh, although you could manually just go through and compare uh, Sean underscore x to each of these rows here and find the shortest one, um, we can actually use scikit-learn to make this a little bit faster. So I've already imported uh, from scikit-learn import neighbors. I have this at the top of the script. So I already have neighbors here, right? Module neighbors from some path. So neighbors, uh, 
is an object that contains k neighbors uh, classifier. And this is what we want to use. So we're trying to classify a new data point based on some other data points. We're trying to find the y label for it, right? And this k neighbors classifier takes one parameter. And this is the number k, right? So the number of neighbors we, we want to consider. So let's just do one for now, right? And actually, um, why don't we do this? Uh, let's do k equals one. And we can do uh, clf equals neighbors, k neighbors classifier, k. And clf just uh, stands for classifier. You can name this anything. So if you type in clf here, it'll print out uh, the class here and how many uh, neighbors you want to consider. So this n underscore neighbors, uh, this is the k that we've been talking about this whole time. So you can put any k you want to here, and for now we'll just do k equals 1. So there are two main functions you want to consider for the classifier, and this is universal across all the different uh, scikit-learn classifiers. So you have clf.fit, right? So fit takes two uh, arguments. There's x and y. x is the same x that we've been talking about here. Uh, it's the input data. And y uh, is an array of the labels. So we already made data x and data y. So let's just pass that in here. And that's it. And this classifier has been fit on this data. So basically, uh, you can think of it as sort of making the map that we talked about earlier based on the data x and data y. So all you have to do now is call clf.predict. And you pass in some x vector, right? So for example, uh, you would pass in Sean underscore x. But the predict member function takes in a two-dimensional uh, array. And the reason is uh, you often want to predict several things at once. So instead of passing in just one x vector, you could pass in multiple uh, different ones. So if you just typed in Sean underscore x and press enter, uh, it would say, Expect a 2D array, but got 1D array instead. So what we have to do here is np.array uh, and, and basically wrap Sean underscore x uh, inside another array. And this gives us a two-dimensional array. So now we do uh, clf.predict. And you see here we get our prediction for Sean. And we see that. Uh, Sean underscore y would be comedy. So just to clean this up, we can do uh, the zeroth element, the zeroth index of this array, right? And we can finally fill in Sean underscore x like this. Sorry, Sean underscore y. And that's our prediction. Okay, so I'm going to clear the screen here to make some room. And let's do k equals 3 instead of 1. And let's make another classifier using this k equals 3. So let's just call the clf2 equals neighbors uh, k neighbors classifier, and then k. And you type in clf2 just to double check, and you'll see n neighbors equals 3. So now we just do the same process again. We do clf2 bit, and you pass in your input data and your output data and it's fit. And now you just do clf2.predict and you pass in uh, Sean's uh, x array again as a 2D array. Right? And we get comedy again. All right, let's just clean it up. And yeah, same thing. So uh, you could see how this could be useful, especially if you have a lot of data. So, you know, we just have six different people here in this example, but you could see how you could extend this to, you know, hundreds, thousands of different users, and you could actually get a pretty decent uh, predictor of somebody's favorite genre just by using uh, essentially these two lines of code, right? The fit member function and predict. And that's basically it for uh, how to use nearest neighbors classifier in scikit-learn. 
If you go to the scikit-learn website, you can read more about the nearest neighbors classifier. And there are some other uh, arguments you can pass. So we talked about the most basic form of KNN, but you could, for example, distribute the weight differently. So what that means is when, for example, some points, some of the neighbors are far from the data point you're trying to predict, the label for, uh, you could put less weight on those points. So if a point is really far away, it may have less impact than a point that's really close to your data point. Uh, so you may want to uh, not take that far away point into consideration as much as the close point. And you can think about different ways to weight that. So it could be, for example, an exponential function. It could be a linear function. Um, and in our case, it's just uniform, right? So no matter how far you are away from the uh, point in question, uh, you give it equal weight as long as it's within the number of neighbors that uh, you have set k to. So basically, if it's inside the radius of interest that we were looking at, everything has the same weight, and we just look at the mode. Another thing is that instead of using uh, classifiers like this, you could do regression. So what that means is, instead of having these colors or these different classes and doing classification, uh, these colors could be numbers, right? So when you're looking at the neighbors that are nearest to your data point, you could, instead of taking the mode, uh, you could take the average, you could take the median, or something more creative uh, to get a prediction for the number associated with your data point, right? And this way you can do regression. Also, we don't have to uh, look at every single data point, right? So when we do look at every single data point, that's called brute force because we're going through every single combination. But the thing is, uh, it might be practical for, you know, uh, six data points. But when you have, you know, tens of thousands or millions of data points, this just takes way too long. So instead, people have come up with more efficient algorithms like the KD tree algorithm or the ball tree algorithm. Um, and these algorithms also pop up in other disciplines. Uh, so it might be a good idea to just kind of read this over. Um, but basically, uh, instead of looking at every single point and comparing the distance between your point and every single point, you could split the space of all the data into different partitions. And for example, in the KD tree algorithm, you would split things up into essentially cubes. And in the ball tree, you split things up into uh, spheres, right? And basically, you're trying to describe all the points with much more efficient data structure. And this makes the nearest neighbor algorithm approximate instead of exact. So you might not find the exact nearest neighbors, uh, the actual nearest neighbors. Uh, you might just find some sort of rough area where you expect uh, the uh, data point in question to lie inside, right? Uh, so you'll get some misclassifications, right? But uh, it'll save you a lot of time and it'll make things a lot more efficient. So uh, in practice, most people use the KD tree or the ball tree instead of the brute force algorithm. Going back to our iris dataset example real quick. If we use brute force, which is what we've been doing so far, then you end up with this kind of uh, complicated boundary, right? And you get these weird uh, islands, right? But if you used KD trees, for example, you're basically trying to approximate these regions with, uh, in this case, rectangles. Um, and of course, you're not going to be as accurate along the boundaries if you do that. But in these regions on the sides here, like this orange or like way over here with the bluish purple, most of the time you're going to be correct. So you're giving up some accuracy, especially along the boundaries between the classes. But in exchange for that, you're increasing the speed quite a bit. So uh, this is not really related to linear algebra, so I won't go into an actual example here. But just know that uh, you can specify flags uh, in the scikit-learn uh, classes to actually uh, use uh, one or, or another of these uh, different algorithms. By the way, I mentioned earlier how if you have way too many features, then even if you have a lot of data points, you might not be able to cover the volume that well. So this is called the curse of dimensionality. And again, it's not specific to k nearest neighbors. And you'll see this pop up over and over again in machine learning and statistics.
All right, so in this video, we went over how to manipulate vectors in NumPy, and we went over the k nearest neighbors algorithm and looked at some code in uh, scikit-learn. So next time, we will go uh, over matrices and matrix properties, and these matrix properties will be the last set of tools we need before we jump into algorithms. So I'll see you over there.